John, thank you. I do want to comment postscript. It took me 42 years to get there, to the embassy. So remain resilient and determined in what you believe. John, good to be with you, and Bill and Ellen Armstrong, Summit friends, all of us. It's my pleasure, and will be yours, I'm certain, to introduce Katie McFarlane, who is a, a friend of freedom, foreign affairs expert, and national security expert. Just by way of background, you should know that KT worked in security positions for three presidents, for Nixon, Ford, and Ronald Reagan. She and I had a breakfast meeting this morning and we, we both commented Ronald Reagan's foresight and vision and the encouragement that she got in those early posts were what put her on the track that has made her a great American. Those are my words, not hers. In addition, in today's world, in, in a world of media and variations of media, KT has become the Fox News National Security Analysis or Analyst. She appears regularly, as you know, on Fox News and Fox Business News and she is blogging, she is communicating with every tool that you could have. Has a very significant radio presence, and I'm sure you will recognize her, either having seen her there or heard her voice on one of these many radio programs. So now it's time to travel the world in foreign affairs and defense matters, and welcome KT McFarlane. Thank you. I just, um, I just want to tell you, you guys have no idea who this lady is. She should be the one speaking to you. Marilyn Ware is a legend in Republican circles, conservative circles, diplomatic circles. She doesn't sing her own praises ever. She stays in the That's background, but ran a major corporation, then went on to be the ambassador to Finland, where they were really not expecting a woman ambassador, <laughs> and has then continued to do great things for conservative causes and Republican causes around the world. So anyway, we're real, I'm Thank honored you. to share the stage Thank with you. you. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. I also, um, if, can you hear me if I walk over here? Yes, okay. I also wanna thank John Andrews because, you know, he gets it. He understands that it's not just about winning enough electoral votes to be president. It's not just about winning enough votes to hold public office, it's about changing the way people think. And I learned that from Ronald Reagan, where he knew it wasn't enough just to be president. He knew you had to get the support of the American people to govern. And we've had political leaders, I think, for the last decade or so who didn't get that. And that's why it's so important, the work that you're doing here, to educate yourself on the issues and to be activated and to be alive and to be part of it. Um, before I start formal remarks, I do think it's important, since I'm going to talk about national security issues, to ask if anyone who has worn the uniform, either in law enforcement or in the military, or whose family member has done so. I'm a Navy mom, so I like to get up too and thank my countrymen. But if anybody has, please stand up, and I want to give you all a round of an applause. Okay, this is awesome. Look at this. Great. And thank you all, because as Ronald Reagan used to say, freedom is just one generation away from being lost. And the fact that people do serve the country and do so under difficult times, I think we all owe you a debt of gratitude, and I hope that the young people here take the example from what you have done with your own lives. Um, I thought what I would do, and I'll do it really quickly because I know I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch, um, is, <laughs> is to tell you who I really am. How many of you watch Fox News? Yeah. Okay. I'm the brunette at Fox News. Uh, and in that regard, um, I have to earn my keep every day as the brunette at Fox News. And so I want to talk to you about the national security issues we face today, the ones that we are likely to face four years from now if we don't have a change of course and then really the future beyond that. 
where are we today? What are the main national security threats and issues we face? Well, the Arab Spring. A year ago, somebody had stood up here and said, this is really great. You know, the entire Middle East is going up in flames, and they're throwing over their dictators, and they're going to have new democratic governments. Guess what? It hasn't happened that way. Um, the countries in the Middle East who have overthrown their dictators have, in the last several days, in fact, in Egypt just last week, have voted to replace those dictators with Islamic governments, with Islamic leaders. And in the, particularly in the case of Egypt, it's the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, do we worry about the Muslim Brotherhood? Well, this is a group that was founded in the 1920s, dedicated to the extermination of Jews. There was no Israeli state at that point, but they still, um, in modern days, have talked about the extermination of the state of Israel. And they talk about establish an Islamic state. Now, you don't know what that means. An Islamic state could be like Iran, where they're state sponsors of terrorism. They're very anti-American. And they're expansionists. Or it could be like Turkey. And you just don't know the direction Egypt is going. But as Egypt goes, so will the rest of the region. Egypt is the largest country in that part of the world. It's the one with the greatest history. It's the one that the other Muslim countries look to. So the elections that were just happened just last week, I think, are, are not a good um, indicator of where things are going. This, so look at what happens with the Arab Spring and where it develops. It's not where we thought it was going to be. And I think that this administration has done a very poor job of pulling the rug out from the countries um, that were our friends and indeed supporting the countries which were not. Where the Arab Spring started was with Iran. Right after President um, Obama was inaugurated, he gave a speech at Cairo University, and he called on the Muslim people in the Arab world to stand up for their rights and demand freedom. And when the Iranian people did just that and went to the streets, President Obama turned the other way, to the point where those people were standing in the streets saying, Obama, Obama, where are you? You've forsaken us. You've given up on us. And President Obama did. He turned his back on the reform movement in Iran, because at that point, he thought he was going to negotiate with the Iranian regime and convince them and charm them out of their nuclear weapons plans. Well, it didn't work out very well. Uh, so that's where we are in the Arab Spring movement. Now, the second thing that we are today is, is really, and I think this is the greatest threat to American security in the immediate sense, is Iran's nuclear weapons program. Iran is trying to do two things. They want a nuclear weapons, they want to be a nuclear weapons state. They are working fast and furiously towards a possession of nuclear weapons. And at the same time, they want to expand to the entire region. They want to be the most powerful country in the Persian Gulf region in, in the Middle East writ large. Why? Because that holds, that is the choke point of world's oil. Except 40 percent of the world's exported oil goes through the Strait of Hormuz. That's past the Iranian border. If Iran controls the Strait of Hormuz and controls the Persian Gulf region, Iran controls the world's oil. And if Iran controls the world's oil, Iran controls the world's economy. So that is the second greatest threat facing America today, and it's one that is present and is, um, you know, they, they really don't see that there's any impediment to what they're about to do, which is to become a nuclear weapon state. The third thing that's important to think about today is Israel. In the last four years, we have basically walked step by step by step by step away from Israel. Now, some people say that's a good thing, that we were too pro-Israeli and we were too anti-Arab. Uh, in the past, but what it does is it convinces Israel increasingly that they're on their own. And if they feel that America doesn't have their back, particularly this administration, they're going to feel compelled to deal with the second threat I just talked about, with it, which is Iran's nuclear weapons program. Israel has said time and time again, the Israeli leadership, both political parties, the elites in Israel have said that Iran as a nuclear weapons state is an existential threat. In other words, Iran gets nuclear weapons, Israel ceases to exist. And that is how they view things. And if they feel the United States is not helping them stop Iran, they will, and in probably in short order, feel it's necessary to take things into their own hands and attack Iran's nuclear weapons sites. The next thing that's facing the United States today is the reset with Russia. That hasn't worked out very well. President Obama came in saying, we're going to reset relations with Russia because they've been so bad. And the Russian leadership looked at President Obama and they said, well, where do you want to reset things back to, 1990s? The 1990s, Russia was on its knees. The Russians were quite pleased with the way things were going in the Bush era because they really felt that they were reclaiming 
their superpower status. They were reclaiming their place in the world. So when President Obama and Secretary Clinton sort of misfired by saying, this is a reset of our relations with, with Russia, the Russians looked askance at that. And really, for the last four years, increasingly, um, Vladimir Putin, who has been in charge all along, has increasingly uh, felt that he's got President Obama right where he wants him. He's put him in a box, and he, he now, to the point where the la meeting they had just two weeks ago, uh, Vladimir Putin just basically lectured Obama the entire time, that he didn't really understand history. Now, Obama had thought that a reset with Russia would improve our relations, not only in stopping Iran's nuclear program, but in, in controlling and, and helping usher in a new era in the Middle East. And it really has not worked. In fact, it's probably been the greatest failure of the Obama administration. And then the final thing I think that we face today that nobody really talks about, it's like the elephant in the room, we know it's there, but we're not really focusing on it, is, is the indebtedness we have to China. You know, every dollar that our government spends, 40 cents is borrowed. And of that 40 cents, half of that is borrowed from China. Now, Hillary Clinton has even said, you don't pick a fight with your banker. It puts the United States in a position where we don't want to be. It puts us in a position where we're not able right now to challenge a lot of the things the Chinese are doing. The Chinese, for example, have a very large cyber command in China dedicated to stealing intellectual property and military secrets from the United States. They've hacked into the Pentagon computers. They've lacked, hacked into Lockheed Martin. I'm sure if any of you represent any large major companies, you've been hacked too. Um, what the Chinese have done with that is that they're able to steal with the click of a mouse something that's cost us years and hundreds of billions of dollars to develop. Estimates are that the Chinese have already stolen and had access to a trillion to two trillion dollars of our critical infrastructure um, and intellectual property and our military development. So for example, um, Lockheed can spend years and billions trying to develop a new stealth bomber. The Chinese click the mouse, and then before you know it, they've got exactly, it looks exactly like the model that we were rolling out, but it turns out the Chinese rolled it out in advance of ours much more quickly, much more cheaply, but it sure looked a lot like ours. So that's the next problem we face, and we're not in a position to really challenge a lot of that because, again, you don't pick a fight with your banker. Now, where are we four years from now? Let's assume that there's no change in leadership and that we continue on with the trajectory that we have. I think you can assume four years from now, Iran is a nuclear weapons state. Now, why do we care? Well, we care because if Iran gets nuclear weapons, the other countries in the region have already announced they too will get nuclear weapons. The Saudis have said they will get nuclear weapons. The United Arab Emirates, they have also said that they are interested in nuclear power. Now, they say they're interested in nuclear energy, but if you're an oil-rich country, you really don't need nuclear energy. You know, your nuclear energy program is just a means to an end towards a nuclear weapons program. The Turks, Turkey will not stand by and watch a nuclear Iran, a nuclear Saudi Arabia, and not develop nuclear weapons of its own. So within the next four years, and I'm not talking about four years that a few crazy far right wing, you know, people who are hysterical say, well, that'll be a nuclear weapons region. That's even the Secretary of Defense who has said the Iranians are probably within a year of nuclear weapons once they make the decision to go ahead with it. So we are talking about four years from now, you will definitely face a nuclear Iran and a nuclear arms race in the single most unstable, dangerous part of the world for which the, the world looks for its energy. I think the second thing you would see four years from now, if there's no change in policy, is a real issue of, of how secure is the future of Israel. If Israel feels, again, that the United States is not going to help them stop Iran, Israel is probably going to feel compelled to attack Iran's nuclear sites by itself. It has in the past, in 1981, when Iraq was developing a nuclear weapons site, nuclear enrichment plant, Iraq, I mean, um, Israel attacked that. Three years ago, when Syria was developing a nuclear weapons, nuclear enrichment plant, Israel attacked that. I think it's a safe assumption that the Israelis are already considering an attack against Iran's nuclear sites. What does that do? It doesn't stop there. Israel can start a war with Iran, but we would be brought into that war because Israel can't finish that war. So where would we be four years from now? We may have a nuclear region. We may also have seen another Arab-Israeli conflict and one that would 
bring in the United States, and if nuclear weapons were there, you know, the, the more likelihood of the nuclear weapons being used in an area where everybody's got nuclear weapons. And a nuclear region in the Middle East means that the next war in the Middle East, and there's always another war in the Middle East. You know, for thousands of years, there's always another war in the Middle East. Could well be a nuclear war, or one in which nuclear weapons were used. The third thing I think you'll see in 2016, if we don't have a change in direction, is the United States' relationship with China will be a very different one. The Chinese are a status quo power. In other words, they're kind of sitting back right now, playing by the rules, building up their economy, lending us the money, building up their military, to the point where, at some point in the not too distant future, they can claim to be the world's greatest economy, and then all the rules change. If China, if we are now talking about, and we've just seen the decision, Governor Brewer spoke about it, others have spoken about it, um, we are now putting the social welfare spending on steroids. And so the amount of money that we are already borrowing is 40 cents of every dollar. We can't tax, there's just not enough rich people to tax them all to make up the difference between all of the social spending that's going to happen in the next four years, especially as the baby boomers continue to retire in greater numbers. So what will happen is that we, the United States will have to borrow more and more and more money. And where is that coming from? It's coming from the loan shark is lending us the money, which is China. And so then four years from now, the United States, I think, will have ceded our economic sovereignty to China unless we figure out a way to turn that around. That's today. That's a pretty scary four years from now. And so you'd conclude that this is just dreadful, right? The world's about to end. Well, I actually am a real pessimist. I've been trained as a nuclear weapons expert at MIT. I'm, I'm one who's always looking at the glass as being half empty. I'm always looking to see what could go wrong in the world. I actually, in the last two years, have become a real optimist. And I'm not talking about the kind of optimist who thinks everything's going to be great, just don't worry about it. You know, there are two competing theories of world history. One says that all nations have their moment, they rise, they have their moment in the sun, and then they inevitably collapse. The other theory says that the United States is exempt from this, that we're somehow different, that we're special, that we are, you know, we're, we're just Americans and it's a different system. Ronald Reagan certainly believed that. I actually have come around to conclude that that second theory is the right one. Now, why? I spent my life studying why nations go to war, why some thrive, why some just sort of fall by the wayside. And I've come up with a couple of things, and America stacks up pretty well in that, in that sort of formula. First, nations go to war because they don't like their neighbors. Okay, we've got pretty good neighbors. To the north, we've got a friend. To the south, we have trouble, but, but not a trouble that's necessarily a military invasion of the United States. And in the east and west, we have a moat. So we don't have a lot of the problems that have plagued Europe, for example, with unfriendly neighbors. The second thing we have going for us is that we've really solved a lot of the tribal, ethnic, and religious problems that tear other nations apart. I mean, the Middle East right now is torn apart by tribal and ethnic and regional problems. Um, Libya. We used to have a strong man in Libya. Now you've got about 17 tribes all fighting against each other. Afghanistan, where I've spent some time, it's all tribal. It's all ethnic. We in the United States, we're not perfect, but we've really come a long way towards solving those tribal, regional, ethnic, you know, racial problems. So we're ahead of it. The next thing is good governance. Now, we kind of throw it away, although thank goodness Glenn Beck is trying to educate us again. We really were given a great government. A lot of countries, when they were founded, had leaders who were in it for themselves, who were corrupt, who were incompetent. We didn't. We have a nation of governance where our laws are respected by all, where we have a succession plan. Look at what's happening in the Middle East today. A lot of what you're seeing in these Middle East countries is people going to the streets because there's no succession plan. When Mubarak tried to hand over the government to his son is when the Egyptian people said, no, we don't want that. The same thing happened in Tunisia and Morocco. Countries go to war and go to civil war when they can't agree on, a, on who's going to succeed the current leader. We've kind of figured that out. We may go to the ballot box, but we don't go to the barricades when we change our leadership. The next thing we have going for us is demographics. And I like to think about demographics as it's sort of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. You don't want to have too much. You don't want to have too little. You want to have it just about right. And we actually have a pretty good demographic situation. 
Right now, China is a demographic time bomb. They have limited themselves to one child per family, and that means they'll have a lot of old people retiring on the backs of one child, and it means because of their preference for male children, there are some parts of China where there are 140 males to 100, fe 100 female births. Nobody knows what that scientific experiment is going to be, but we all know it's not going to be good. The United States has some economic, I mean, some demographic population growth, but not too much. Again, part of the problem in the Middle East today is that 75 percent of most of the countries in the Middle East have a population under the age of 30, and they don't have jobs. That's a revolution in the making. Russia has the opposite problem. So does Japan. They're not reproducing themselves at a rate to sustain economic development. So the United States, we figure, we really, by luck, I think, we have a pretty good demographic ratio going forward. The next thing that we have that a lot of countries don't have is women. Uh, <laughs> Ambassador Ware and I have been out there on the forefront of women's movements. <laughs> but in a lot of countries, um, women are educated but aren't allowed to enter the workforce. Japan would be an example. In the Middle East, women aren't even educated. And yet economists tell us that women who are educated and join the workforce is a 30, 40 percent increase in GNP. We've got that one solved. So we're riding pretty good. The only problem that we have, I think, is our debt and deficit problems. We can't seem to summon the political will to pay off our debt or to balance our budget. And for that, the good Lord and divine providence have thrown us a lifesaver. Because if you look at why do countries, again, in the, since the Industrial Revolution, why do countries go to war? We fight over energy. World War I was in part Germany trying to get hold of the coal fields of Central Europe. And World War II was in part the Japanese trying to get access to oil. And the last two Gulf Wars have been over oil. We have found in the United States in the last three years Two things have happened. Our engineers have developed the technology that we can look deep underneath the oceans and under the surface of the earth for energy, oil and natural gas. And when we have looked, we have found we have an abundant supply. We have more oil than Saudi Arabia. We have more natural gas than Russia. We have enough energy in oil and natural gas to really be the world's energy superpower for the next, not 100 years, but 500 years. And so at the end of the day, what is that going to do? That's an energy renaissance that's going to revitalize American industry. It's going to help us pay off the debt. It's going to balance our budget. And it's going to bring jobs back to the United States as American manufacturing becomes competitive again. So I, in fact, have great confidence in the future. But the only thing that stands between us and the future, like me and lunch, is that we have to have the, have, we have, to have the you know, national will to do it. We have to have the national will to develop our energy resources. We have to have the national will to say leading from behind just isn't going to be good enough. We have to have the national will to say we are indeed different. The American system of government is different, American people are different, and America's future is different. And we need to develop that. Now, how do we do that? I would challenge every one of the young people in here to say this is your moment. I was part of the Reagan Revolution. When I went to Washington with President Reagan, it was a bunch of old people in charge, a bunch of you know, real adults, but there were a lot of kids who were really the revolution. Whatever happens in November, or in the next November, or in the next November, this is an opportunity for the young people of America to get involved. This only happens once a generation. We have to relearn those lessons every generation, as Reagan taught us, that we have to learn relearn the dedication to individualism and entrepreneurial spirit and the can-do and get away from that whole notion of entitlement and whining and feeling sorry for ourselves. And who's going to do that? It's the young people. So if you, any young people in the, in the room, go get involved politically. Get involved in a campaign, run for office yourself. Go volunteer. And for anybody in the room like me, I have a, we're, Alan and I have five children, and you know, if you're graduating from college today, you're 50, facing 50 percent unemployment. So mom and dad, kick the kid off the couch. Tell him to go, get a job. If he can't get a job, go get involved politically. And that's how we'll actually get to the future that we all want. So with that, I am standing here, and you guys get to be Sean Hannity and ask me the really tough questions. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Absolutely, we do. Good. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.